I'm Randy Gordon, and I've spent my life in the sport of boxing. Tell me where your passion for boxing started. It all started for me on my birthday, my 11th birthday, March 11th, 1960, because at that time I was sitting in a wheelchair. Back in August of 59, I was burned severely on my right leg in a gasoline explosion. And for the next year, I remained in a wheelchair as I was learning to walk again. And then on my birthday, my parents took me and my brother Jerry out to dinner. And then when we came home and my brother went to sleep that night, my father was looking around on television. He comes to the Friday night fights. And he said, hey, Randy, you want to watch some fights? I had never really watched the fights before. I knew something about boxing, so I said, okay, fine. And I sat there in my wheelchair watching Emil Griffith and Denny Moyer move around the ring. Then I'm listening to Don Dunphy do the announcing. Emil Griffith sticks a left hand to the face. Denny Moyer moves. And I'm like, wow, I, I love the way this sounds. I'm watching these two guys with their artistry and their movement. And I'm thinking to myself, man, I wish I could move around like that, but I don't know that I'll ever be able to get out of this wheelchair again. And I love what I saw that night. And Emil Griffith wins the decision. Little did I realize that I'd become such a fight fan that Emil Griffith would become one of my best friends in life. But I started watching boxing religiously. I just did not miss a fight on Friday night. And many times I'd watch the guys, and now I'd be sitting there, and I never knew what hooking off a jab meant or what the uppercut was. And I started learning all these terms from Don Dunphy. And I began reading Ring Magazine from cover to cover. And this is 1960, 61, 62, learning about every single fighter out there from Floyd Patterson and Sonny Liston down to every single flyweight, Chachai Chanoy, and everybody else. And I just became a, not just a fight fan, but a fight nut. And by the time I was a junior in high school, I knew that some way, somehow, I was gonna be getting into boxing. But quite frankly, I really wanted to play professional baseball. I wanted to play professional football. But I wanted to be the six foot six, 250 pound defensive end of the New York Giants. And by the time I got out of high school, I was not six foot six, I was five foot six. And I didn't weigh 250, I weighed 115. Where does a 115 pound athlete go? Well, I didn't know much about horses, so I couldn't be a, a jockey. I decided to try my hand at boxing, and I had 39 amateur fights, winning 37 of them. Later on, I had one pro fight. I retired at 0-1, but I learned so much about boxing, and who knew that one day this guy that I was listening to, Don Dunphy, would call me up and ask, would you announce a fight with me in a couple of weeks in Atlantic City? And Don liked working alone. And I became basically the only color commentator he ever allowed to work with him. So, I mean, for a fight fan, it was just a dream come true. Where did you train on Long Island? And what did you learn about training, the actual being in the gym and putting in the work? And what did that teach you? I already learned about how to deal with pain from my burn. I went through pain that no individual should ever have to go through. And it was step by step that I was able to get out of my wheelchair. And when I started to walk, the doctor said, you will never walk without a limp. And then I started to walk without a limp. And they said, that's all you're ever going to be able to do. You're never going to be able to run. Well, I did run. And I ran very fast. And it showed me, if you put your mind to it, you really can achieve things that you wouldn't believe you can. But when I graduated high school, I said, OK, now we're going to start boxing because obviously we're not going to be playing pro football or baseball or anything like that. So we started boxing. And the training was very, very hard, and I loved the discipline. And I kept thinking back to 
those two guys that I watched on television, Emil Griffith and Denny Moyer. And I wanted to move just like them. And I, I just got into the boxing and I, I love the training. I love the whole artistry of it. I call, and to this day, I call boxing ballet with bruises. What was the process? How did you meet Stanley Weston or who did you meet there? And how did that whole thing roll out? I guess in life, everything is really mapped out for you. Your master plan is there. And in 1973, I was a disc jockey on Long Island's radio station, WGBB. And I was the all-night disc jockey. And while we were spinning some records one night, I'm looking through Newsday, and I'm going through the Help Wanted, and I see a little tiny Help Wanted ad, and it said, Editor needed, strong grammar, excellent in editing and spelling, knowledge of boxing preferable. Whoa, this is me. And I cut it out, pasted it on a card. The next day, I called, and it was in Freeport, Long Island, the office of GC London Publishing Corporation. And I called them. I said, I have a very strong knowledge of boxing. And they invited me in for an interview. And I met with the owner of the company, Stanley Weston. And he said, what I want you to do is write a story for me on Barney Ross. I'll give you a week to turn it in. And I wrote it. And I went on forever in the story. He read it. He said, I asked for a story on Barney Ross, not a book. He said, I know you can do it. I'm going to give you one more chance. Throws it back at me. Give me three pages on Barney Ross, not 30 pages. I gave him three pages on Barney Ross. He said, this is what I'm looking for. You're hired. I said, when do I start? He said, tomorrow. And he brings me in and introduces me to the staff. And I became the assistant editor for World Boxing, International Boxing, Big Book of Boxing, The Wrestler Inside Wrestling. And something that he put out, called Apartment House Wrestling, <laughs> which to this day, wrestling fans remember that. And when I tell them that I work for Apartment House Wrestling, that I wrote most of the magazine, you wrote that? Well, I guess the less said about that magazine, the better. <laughs> but it actually was one of the big sellers for his company. And it's where we made our bonuses. He would give us very healthy bonuses at the end of the year basically because of the money that Apartment House Wrestling brought in. And that was, that was the real launching pad for my career because I spent about five and a half years there before Ring Magazine was sold. They were down in the dumps. They were basically out of business because of the uh, King Ring ABC scandal in the late 70s. There were actually several stories that I really enjoyed writing for GC London Publishing. And then because Stanley Weston was basically so cheap, there would never be a road trip for us. He would barely pay for the Long Island Railroad to get us into the city. He said, nobody is going to realize if you cover the fight from television. And he made us cover fights from the television. But if you were a fight fan, you weren't really reading Ring Magazine at this point, which was really slipping uh, in readership because its editing and writing was so poor, you would be reading World Boxing Magazine, International Boxing, Big Book of Boxing. And we had to cover the rumble in the jungle, watching it on big screen from the Nassau Coliseum. I did an interview with Joe Frazier where it was only about a day or two before he left to face Muhammad Ali in the thriller in Manila. And it was me and Joe and my tape recorder. And Joe said, we got a referee in there who's not going to let Clay hold. He called him Clay. And the referee was Carlos Padilla. And Padilla did not allow Ali to hold. And it turned into the most savage heavyweight championship fight in history. And I had this interview with Joe Frazier only hours before he left. So those are some of my real memories as I really got into being a boxing writer. And I knew this was going to be my life. What's that 
like pinch me moment the first time you're in the press section at a big fight and, and how does that how did how did you feel? I think that that one moment came to me. It wasn't really anything with Stanley Weston's publications because we didn't get to go to many big fights. I mean, I did get to go to a few Sugar Ray Leonard events in 77, 78, early 79, but it was one of these jump on a, on a train, get there, or take a quick flight and get home, take the red eye home that night, or whatever, you better be in the office the next day. For no reason, there was no reason we had to be, I could write on the plane. Yeah. It made no sense, but we were. So there was never really one of those moments. But I did get to meet Muhammad Ali during those early years. But I was this beginning reporter, and everybody usually when I was standing in a group, there was Mike Katz and Pat Putnam and Bob Waters and Dave Anderson and Dick Young. and. I was kind of in the back and I was a little bit intimidated, but I, I guess one of my real pinch me moments came and I, I had a friendship with Larry Holmes, was in October 1980. I'm already the editor in chief of Ring Magazine and I'm sitting ringside for the Larry Holmes title defense against Muhammad Ali. And at that fight, Christy Brinkley was sitting in the celebrity section and she recognizes me from being the editor-in-chief of Ring Magazine. She was a fight fan, still is. All of a sudden she starts calling my name and a lot of the writers, Dick Young's going, hey Randy, you know who fashion model Christy Brinkley is? I said, yeah. He said, she, she's calling you. I said, she can't be calling me. I don't know who Christy Brinkley is. Well. It turned out, I looked, and Christy Brinkley's, she's pointing at me. And I'm like, me? And, yeah. What? Me? And this went on about, me? I wanted to make sure it was me, because if I walked up there and said hello, she, I, you, him. She's going, hi, Randy, I'm Christy Brinkley. I said, yeah, I, I know who you are. And I said, what's happening? <laughs> I mean, what, what do you ask? I mean, she said, Listen, I am a fight fan. Could you get me a press ticket to work for you and, and shoot fights on the ring? I said, you want to work for me and Bert Sugar? I said, we can't afford you. And she said, how about this? You get me the press ticket. I'll shoot for ring. I'll give you all the photos. You do not pay me. The only thing you give me is a photo credit by Christy Brinkley. And I'm saying to myself, this has to be a dream. This can't be happening. And she said, if it's a fight in Vegas or anywhere else, I'll pay my flight, I'll pay my hotel. You pay me nothing. I just need that press ticket, which I can't get. I said, done. I go back to ringside and I say to Bert Sugar, he said, what was that about? I said, we just hired Christy Brinkley. He looks at me, he said, are you crazy? How much did you offer her? I said, she's working for free. What? You're going to have to explain this to me. Let's watch the fight. Just give me a quick recap of the ring, how you got to ring. Well, Ring Magazine from 1976, 77, 78, 79 was downhill because they got involved in, in this U.S. boxing championships. And... It turned out to be a whole phony tournament, tainted ratings and everything. And the magazine basically put Ring Magazine into bankruptcy. With that, Burt Randolph Sugar in 1979 bought the Ring Publishing Company with basketball star Dave DeBuscher. And they needed an editor-in-chief and a guy who'd really run the magazine. And they went around and asked a lot of people, put five guys who you think can do the job. And Bert Sugar called me, he said, you were not number one on any list, but you were the only one on everybody's list. So I'm calling you, can I meet you? I met him in the city, and I knew that I had reached, basically after five years, um, my max. 
with uh, GC London Publishing Corporation, I left, and the day that I told Stan Weston that I was leaving for Ring Magazine to become the editor, instead of him saying, congratulations, he got red in the face, pointed to the door, and said, get out! And the rest of the staff convinced him that I should stay for a week or two. I stayed for one more week, but then I left for Ring Magazine, and uh, I, I knew that I was a boxing lifer. To, to the boxing insider, that's a big responsibility. Did you see it that way? Did you approach it that way? I knew, I used to swear by the ring ratings. If you were number one in ring, you were indeed number one. But because the ring ratings had become tainted over the last few years, I knew that Bert and I couldn't just walk in there and start doing the ratings again because I hadn't built up the kind of reputation yet that you could really believe. You know, what is Randy Gordon? Who's he? So... Bert Sugar and I sat down to try to figure out, how do we do this? And I suggested to Bert, why don't we have some international ratings panel? And we start throwing ideas around. And we took a hundred names from around the globe. The great Joe Kuzumi from Japan, who is now involved with Naoya Inoue and, and uh, the Shigeoka brothers, who are both champions. and. Um, Actually, one of them just lost their light flyweight championship. But Joe Kozumi is Mr. Boxing in Japan. We took guys like that. And again, no internet. So we used to mail the ballots every month. Heavyweights, light heavyweights. There was no cruiserweight then. Light heavyweights and middleweights. And we mail it. And it, you have to have your ballots. Mark them. Send them back within a week. We get stacks, and we had about 120 guys or so on the panel. And I think the most we ever got back was around 100. And then I would sit there and compile heavyweights. He has number one. He has, and it took a week, basically about 25 hours a day, to do the, to compile these. It really drove me nuts. But we got the ratings done, and they were ratings you could trust and believe in. And I knew that if we could restore credibility to Ring, and I believe that the very loquacious and a guy who loved the camera and his ink, Bert Sugar, who allowed me to do my thing, well, together we would make a great team. And I think we put together some incredible Ring magazines, including the biggest seller of all time, the Tommy Hearns Hitman cover. So as it turns out, one of my children had a water pistol shaped like a Tommy gun, a black Tommy gun about this big, and it looked real. And if you look at the cover of Ring Magazine and you see Tommy Hearns standing there, everybody swears that's a real Tommy gun. And then Bert and I continue. A Tommy gun wearing Bert's one of his black fedoras in a black sinister looking suit. Now he's gonna really look like a hitman. Well, he comes up to the office and he's got a press conference a little bit later and we only had a certain amount of time to do this in, maybe about an hour. And we set up the studio and Tommy stands on the paper and I tell him exactly, look at the camera, give us a mean face. Tommy is laughing his butt off, and I'm standing right next to him. Tommy! I'm smacking Tommy Hearns. Mean! And he's looking. And he is laughing. He wouldn't stop laughing. And we were taking one shot after another with the digital camera, and he's looking. He's, Tommy, I got hundreds of pictures of you. You're smiling and every. Tommy, I can't help it. And Emmanuel Stewart is looking at his watch saying, we got 15 minutes left. Tommy, you gotta get to this press conference. I said, we'll get the shot. And he's taking one shot after another. And finally he goes, and he gave a look into the camera and my photographer goes, got it. And as he said, got it, Amanda said, we have to go. <laughs> With that, he puts down, he takes up that. And it turned out, he shows me, I said, oh yes, this is the shot. And then we could picture blowing it up, putting ring above it, yeah. the hitman.
Your first, your first TV gig was ESPN? It turns out that in late 1980, this fledgling television cable network was beginning the Entertainment and Sports Programming Network. And they were doing a lot of Australian rules football, and they were doing boxing from Detroit, from Atlantic City, basically. And they were using Sal Marciano to do the blow-by-blow blow, and a young, unknown writer by the name of Al Bernstein. And they hired, I get a call, from Shelley Finkel, the fight manager, and he asked, would you like to do some announcing on this new network? And I said, yeah. He said, because I spoke to Bob Arum about it, and Bob said, yeah, he'd love to try you out. He was basically calling the shots. And then I got a, a shot, and I start doing the East Coast fights, and Sal Marciano and Al Bernstein start doing the West Coast fights. And we would split the middle of the country fights, and it was Sal and Al, and Sal and Randy. And I wound up doing that for two years. And then in September of 1982, I blew the whistle on a fight for ESPN where a guy was fighting under a medical suspension. Only five days earlier, he got knocked out in New York. And Teddy Brenner, the outstanding Hall of Fame matchmaker from Top Rank, said to me, you shut your mouth about this. If you say anything, you're gone from ESPN. That really pushed my buttons. Don't threaten me like that. And I went on the air and I didn't just mention it, I beat it to death. Two weeks later, I'm gone from ESPN. Years later, Teddy Brenner came over to me and he, when I became commissioner in New York and he said, can we talk? And he said, that never should have happened. You and I should have just talked this out. And we made up, and over all these years, Bob Arum and I, we're friends. He comes on my Sirius XM show all the time. and It was, again, one of those things, and I, I look at it like this is the way the master plan was made out to be. And I went from there, got a name for being fired for telling the truth. I get hired by the USA Network and the MSJ ne Network at the same time, and I begin you know, a whole new career as a as a sportscaster, and I left Ring Magazine in 1984 and went full-time in television. And uh, then in 1988, I left all of that behind when I got called for, uh, to become commissioner in New York by Governor Mario Cuomo of New York. Just, just quickly talk about, you know, broadcasting at MSG. The Madison Square Garden Network. And I'm working with two outstanding blow-by-blow -blow guys. One, Sam Rosen. Hall of Fame hockey announcer, nobody better than Sam Rosen, and Bruce Beck, who has gone on to be a network announcer on NBC every night. We go to bed watching Bruce Beck. These are the guys I'm working with, and we are calling fights of Reggie Tour and Kevin Kelly and Freddie Liberatore and... and Michael Bent and Mark Breland and uh, Iran Barkley, on and on. Every week there were some different fights. And Bob Gutkowski, who was then the president of the Madison Square Garden Network, he said, I am hiring you because you tell the truth. And if you have to call one of our fights an awful fight, then you call it an awful fight and you're not going to be fired for it. He said, but try not to call it an awful fight. Try to find another way to do that. But I enjoyed working for them for the two and a half years that I did when all of a sudden that call came for me to be commissioner, and it was a very difficult choice. When I became commissioner in New York, I knew, I, I actually, my wife and I had to go away just to get away from the entire family. I, I needed, I actually really needed to get away by myself, which I didn't. But I did say to my wife several times, I need to just go out and walk on the beach and just be my, by myself for a little while. Because I knew that by becoming commissioner, I knew all the other commissioners. And I knew what they were, what they weren't, what they went through, how they handled things. And I said, how am I going to handle things when I get jumped on by the media, sometimes unfairly, which I knew would happen. And it did happen, but I prepared myself for it. 
And I believe the job, which I had from 1988 till 1995, was somewhat of a turning point because at that point, when I became commissioner, I was 38 years old. I was the youngest commissioner New York had ever had. But it pushed me just that, gave me that nudge to really make me grow up. I was a, I was a father and I really was grown up, but it pushed me to that other level which made me see boxing from a, a perspective no person had ever seen. Nobody had ever been a writer of the level that I was and an announcer of the level that I was and now commissioner. So I'm seeing it from every single angle. I had to, when promoters came in, I had to deny some of their fights. I'm not gonna allow this fight because I think it's a mismatch. I have to call you to tell you that your guy flunked a drug test like this. And he said, but it was so low. I said, are you a little bit pregnant or are you pregnant? I said, it's one or the other. He flunked the drug test. He flunked A and he flunked B. He's out of the fight. There was the time in Mexico City in 1988 when Don King gave me an envelope that had bricks of $100 dollar bills in it. I didn't stop to look at them and count them. I didn't even see really how many there were. There had to be at least six, seven, eight of them. There was a good 80,000, 90,000, maybe a hundred thousand dollars there that I could have just taken and put in my pocket and did what he wanted me to do, which was break Mike Tyson's contract with Bill Caton and Jim Jacobs, which by the way, was signed illegally by the New York State Athletic Commission and then Chairman Jose Torres. If they allowed the process to go through, it would have gone through and I probably would have broken the contract. Show. Just talk a little bit about your show and Jerry, you know, uh, t t tell people where they can find it, where they can listen to it, and uh, just talk about the last couple of years doing that. 2007, I got hired by Sirius XM Radio. I heard that they were doing a show on MMA, on the UFC. and. I became a fan of the UFC and combat sports and they hired me. And for about two years, I did the show by myself. And then in 2009, the president of Sirius Radio, Scott Greenstein walked over to me and he's a big fight fan. And he said, Randy, why are you working here doing an MMA show when you should be doing a boxing show? I said, well, I know the president of sports doesn't like it. He said, I love it. I'm the president of the company. I want it. Do you want to do a boxing show? I said, I do. And then he asked about Jerry Cooney. What's he doing? And I didn't know why. I called Jerry Cooney. He gets invited to lunch by Scott Greenstein. He has the two of us sitting there. He said, Jerry, how do you like to do a boxing show here on Sirius? And Jerry said, really? And he said, Mr. Greenstein, you mean like me and Larry Holmes? And Scott said, no, like you and Randy. Jerry looks at me. He said, I'd love to. Our show, At The Fights, was born then back in 2009. And we are now on our 15th anniversary doing the show every Monday, every Friday, from noon till 2 p.m. on channel 156, At The Fights. We call ourselves Cooney and the Commish. And we have the longest running major radio boxing show, we have a massive audience, we get some great guests, and I love my Mondays and Fridays when I get to work with my twin brother, gentleman Jerry Cooney. And we're actually, if you remember the movie Twins, we're doing a shot the next couple of weeks, me and Jerry in that same position as Arnold Schwarzenegger and Danny DeVito. This has all been, I still think that I'm dreaming, and I'm gonna wake up, wow, did I have one incredible, fantastic dream.